Welcome to episode 5 in our series on Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato's The Path of the Just. And we are halfway through uh, chapter 4, which is dealing with uh, the concept of acquiring vigilance uh, as part of your character development. And uh, just to recap on this particular chapter, uh, we're now going to be dealing uh, with the concept of God's uh, reward and punishment and how no person, however pious uh, or holy, is uh, free from God's judgment. It's up to God how he deems the judgment applicable, but justice, if it's going to be perfect justice, which is what God delivers, has to be uh, delivered. How God chooses to deliver it is something else. Um, so this second half is going to deal with the concept of remaining vigilant, realizing that however pious you become, if you commit a sin or if your standards slide, you can't expect God to, to let it slide. He has to met out the punishment. If you, uh, he, he, you know, probably God does it regretfully. But if he punishes others, you have to be punished too. If but you, uh, uh, but so what uh, the Ramchal is going to do here is going to quote uh, some of our great um, ancestors and uh, and describe how they could not escape God's justice, even though you would have thought that the lives they led would perhaps allow them some sort of leeway. But no, even the most pious and the greatest of our prophets were, uh, were punished. So, um, so the Ramchal continues, this is halfway through chapter 4, and he gives examples of this concept in the Torah. So he describes, first of all, Avraham. Uh, this is the same Avraham who was so beloved by his maker that the Eternal said of him, and he quotes from Yeshayahu, Avraham, my beloved. Nonetheless, he did not escape judgment and was judged for lack of meticulousness in minor matters. When he says, and he quotes from uh, Lech Lecha, uh, how will I know? Uh, he asked God, I think this was... Um, uh, referring to um, how will I know my, my offspring will become what you say they will be. Uh, Hashem responded by saying, I swear you shall surely know, for your descendants will be foreigners. That's taken from Pukei de Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 48. And because of the treaty that he made with Avimelech, without having been commanded by the Eternal to do so, so the Holy One, blessed be he, said, and it quotes this from Boratius Rabbah 54.4, I swear that I shall impede your children's rejoicing for seven generations. I believe this is the, for the war between the five kings, and he uh, made a treaty without consulting God on this matter. Now he brings the case of Yaakov. Uh, Yaakov, is, he continues, referring to Yaakov's angry reaction to Rachel, when he said to him in um, Bayetse, uh, give me children. And the Midrash, Boratius Rabbah 71.7 relates, the Holy One, blessed be he said, is this how you respond to those who are anguished? I swear that your children from Leah will yet stand in submission before her son. And because he placed Dina in a chest to prevent Asaph from taking her, even though he certainly meant well, the result was that he withheld his benevolence from his brother. And the Midrash says, and he quotes from Boratius Rabbah, 76 verse 9, The Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, for withholding benevolence from another. That's from Job 6 14. You did not want to marry her off to one who is circumcised, so she will be wed to one who is uncircumcised. You did not want to marry her off in a manner that is permissible, so she will be wed in a manner that is prohibited. And now the Ramchal brings the example of Yosef. Yosef, because he said to the chief wine butler, uh, this is from Vayeshev, 
um, 40, 14, such that if you would mention me with you, which showed lack of trust in the Eternal. I think this is when he was in jail, and he, uh, or, or, or this was when he uh, tried to get the chief wine butler to put in a good word, uh, which was um, perhaps lacking a bit of emunah in, in God to release him. Yosef had two years added to his imprisonment, as uh, it is quoted from Boratius Rabbah 89 verse 3. Yosef was also at fault for embalming his father without the Eternal's permission, or because he heard, your servant, our father, in, that's from Miketz, uh, 44 chapter 27, and remained silent. According to either opinion, he died before his brothers. That's Boratius Rabbah 100 verse 3. Your servant, our father, I think refers to when the brothers came down. And once they mentioned to the unrecognized Yosef, uh, your servant, our father, a son would have piped up by then to say, look, I am your father's son. So he was punished for that. Lack of respect. David Hamelech. Uh, he, uh, Ram Chal says, David, because he referred to words of the Torah as songs. That's from uh, in Tehillim 119.54. He was punished by the intrusion of the incident at Uzzah, which disrupted his rejoicing. I think that's when he touched the Aaron, when he said it was moving, uh, or, or, or someone touched the uh, Aaron HaKodesh. Um, Michal because she admonished David for dancing in public before the ark. She was punished that she wouldn't give birth to a child until she was dying. Chizkiyahu, because Chizkiyahu showed the treasure house to the officers of the Babylonian king. It was decreed that his children should become ministers in the, in the palace of the king of Babylonia. And there were numerous instances of this kind. In the chapter, Hakol Chayavim, all are obligated, our sages said, Rabbi Yochanan used to cry when he came to the following verse, and I will hasten your judgment and I will testify quickly against the magicians, the adulterers, those who swear in vain, and those who oppress the hireling in his wages. That's from Malachi, chapter 3, verse 5. Is there, then, a remedy for a servant whose lighter offences are equated with his graver offences? Surely, the intent of this passage is not that there will be equal punishment for both. The Holy One, blessed be he, exacts retribution measure for measure. Rather, regarding the weighing of one's deeds, the lighter offences are weighed just as the graver ones are. The latter will not cause the former to be forgotten, and the ultimate judge, referring to God, will not ignore the lighter ones any more than he will the graver ones. Instead, he will watch over them and oversee all of them equally, judging each one and subsequently meting out punishments to each one in just measure. This is what Shlomo HaMelech, Oliver Shalom, says in Ecclesiastes 12.14. For God will bring every action to justice. Just as the Holy One, blessed be he, does not allow any good deed, however small, to go unrewarded, he will not allow any bad deed, however small, to go unjudged or unchastised. So we we beginning to understand that no concessions are made by God in his divine scheme of justice. And the Ramchal continues, The purpose of this verse, for, furthermore, is to counteract the thought of those who would be tempted to believe that the Master, referring to Hashem, will not include in his judgments the lighter offences and will not require an accounting of them. But in fact, this is one of our fundamental truths. And he quotes from Baba Kama, 50 Ahmed Aleph, Whoever says that the Holy One, blessed be he, overlooks things, will have his innards overlooked. And similarly, they said, and he quotes from Chagiga 16a, if the evil inclination says to you, sin, and the Holy One, blessed be he, will be forgiving, do not listen to him. This is self-evident and clearly spelt out because the Eternal is a God of truth. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu said in 
Devorim chapter 32 verse 4. The rock, his actions are perfect, for all his ways are just. A faithful God without injustice. Since the Holy One, blessed be he, wants a world of justice, it will be a violation of justice to turn a blind eye either to merit or to misconduct. Consequently, if there is meant to be justice, he must repay each person in accordance with his conduct and the results of his actions, both for good and for bad, with the strictest of precision. This is what our sages of blessed memory said, and he quotes from Ta'anis 11 Omadalaf, a faithful God without iniquity, righteous and fair is he. That's from Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. For the righteous as well as the wicked. This is the standard. And he judges everything and punishes each sin. And no one can escape from this. You might ask how the attribute of compassion enters into all of this. Since in all cases justice must be precise. The answer is that the attribute of compassion is undoubtedly holding up the world. Without which the world could not exist at all. So that's very true. The Ramchal pointing out that there is this, uh, this uh, strata of compassion in reality that does hold the world up. It's not black and white in terms of uh, ju uh, in terms of uh, reward and punishment. There seems to be some sort of uh, uh, a different, a di like a differentiation in uh, in the timelines of punishments, perhaps, and in the and the exactitude is not perhaps as precise as you would think in this in this uh, circumstance. It seems as if God weighs up in a certain His way. The, the metting out uh, of punishments and rewards. And the, we're about to, well, the Ramchal is about to describe that. Nonetheless, this does not rule out the function of the attribute of justice. For according to the letter of the law, the sinner should be punished immediately, subsequent to his sinful act, without any delay. Furthermore, the punishment should be meted out with, an ang with anger, since it is directed against one who has rebelled against the words of the Creator, blessed be his name, and there should be no way whatsoever to atone for the sin. How, in fact, can a person rectify that which he has ruined once a sin has been committed? For example, if a person has killed another or has committed adultery, how can this be rectified? Can he purge from reality the act that he has been done that has been done? The attribute of compassion, however, yields the opposite of the three things mentioned above. Time is extended to the sinner and he is not destroyed as soon as he has sinned. The punishment itself will not be total. The possibility of repenting will be granted to the sinner as an act of benevolence, so that the uprooting of the penitent's will should be equivalent to the uprooting of the deed. This means that since the penitent recognizes his sin, admits his guilt and ponders his wrongdoing, repents and totally regrets all that he has done from the outset, as in the declaration of regret over a vow that was taken, so that his regret is so complete that he wishes the deed had never been done, and he is filled with a terrible anguish that it was done, and from here on he severs himself from it and flees from it. Then the willful uprooting of the deed will be like the uprooting of the vow, and it will be an effective act of atonement for him. This is what scripture says, and he quotes here from Yeshayahu chapter 6, Verse 7, and your iniquity will disappear and your sin will be atoned for. This means that the sin will literally disappear from reality and will be uprooted retroactively as a result of one's current anguish and his regret over the past. This surely is benevolence for it goes beyond the letter of the law. So the Ramchal reminding us that we can't uh, say that we are lost we can't give up hope on our own salvation. If God will allow us to uh, recover ourselves from any misdeed or any transgression, 
we should remember that. And But the only thing that God asks is conviction and genuine remorse, genuine uh, repentance and a and a commitment never ever to uh, do that um, misdeed again uh, but it has to be real but if it is real it will be uprooted as if nothing happened um, now the uh, now the Ramchal is going to describe or uh, relay that there is no real contradiction between the attribute of justice and that of compassion. So the Ramchal continues, nonetheless, it is a benevolence that does not undermine the attribute of justice completely, for it allows for the assumption that the satisfaction and pleasure derived from sinning have now been replaced with regret and, ang and anguish. Similarly, the extra time granted between the sin and the punishment is not an instance of tolerance towards sinful behavior, but rather a brief waiting period to allow one the opportunity to adopt corrective measures. Um, similarly, the other acts of divine benevolence that are mentioned by our sages, such as a son bestows credit upon his father, that's from Sanhedrin 104a, or a partial life that has been taken, is as if the whole life were taken. Uh, that's from Kohelet Rabbah 727. Are all expressive of the ways of divine benevolence to accept a minimum as if it were the maximum. They do not, however, conflict with or actually contradict the attribute of justice, since there already exists a justification to account for them. At the same time, for sins to be completely overlooked or ignored would be entirely contrary to the concept of justice. That would be neither true judgment nor true justice. That would be an impossibility, and if any of any one of the above-mentioned approaches will not be found as an avenue for the sinner's escape. The attribute of justice will surely not return empty-handed. This is what the sages of blessed memory have said. And he quotes from Yerushalmi Ta'anis 2.1. He is slow to anger, yet demands what is his. Summary. There is no temptation great enough to prevent one from total vigilance and meticulousness if only he were to open his eyes. There are the outlooks and observations by means, sorry, these are the outlooks and observations by means of which a person will certainly be able to acquire the virtue of vigilance if he aspires to spirituality. So that concludes the fourth chapter and uh, the, the Ramchal is giving us every reason to adopt this mindset of vigilance and understand the virtue of vigilance. Be on your guard to avoid uh, any sins. Um, see things from afar, avoid them. Put yourself out of situations that would perhaps lead to various misdeeds, but if you do sin, uh, understand that if you um, commit the crime, you've got to do the time. And God, but God in his mercy, as it's said, he is slow to anger. He's not slow to anger, he's slow to punish. And, uh, and that's the compassion in itself, as the Ram Khala has described. So, um, a lot to think about there. And in the next episode, we're going to deal in chapter 5, and he's going to describe the factors that undermine vigilance and how to avoid them.